Welcome uh, to today's program. My name is Glenn Deason. I'm a professor of political science and Russian foreign policy. Uh, with me is Alexander McCurris from the very popular uh, Duran podcast. And the guest today is the excellent uh, Alistair Crook. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. So, yeah, please me if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, your background includes, uh, I think, almost 30 years in uh, MI6 with uh, British intelligence. Uh, you've yeah, not only been a British diplomat, but you also have background from EU diplomacy as an advisor of uh, Javier Solana, which was the uh, highest representative of the EU's uh, common foreign and security policy. And uh, also, yeah, I guess from the top echelons of democracy, sorry, diplomacy, uh, you also have a lot of experience with negotiations, uh, de-escalation and uh, peace negotiations. So uh, I guess if there's one thing uh, sorely missed in the past 18 months, it's really been diplomacy and de-escalation. So it's uh, greatly, uh, yeah, certainly great to have you on today. And um, I, I guess to address the problem of finding a political settlement to the Ukrainian war, uh, we wanted to start by speaking about this article you recently published called uh, Hotel Ukraine. Sure, you can uh, check out any time, but you can never leave. Uh, obviously, the reference to Eagles uh, Hotel California. Uh, so, so, but you argue that all the participants in the Ukrainian war, be it Russia, Ukraine, the United States and the Europeans, have all to some extent uh, boxed themselves in uh, as there's not really an exit out of this conflict. Uh, I was wondering if you can elaborate or explain. Yes. I mean, the purpose of uh, Hotel California, um, which was um, seen to me out because um, in all my experience in these sort of conflicts, you know, you, you know, it's easy to get in and everyone assumes getting out is just as easy. And so hence the sort of title, which is, you know, um, uh, you're always welcome to come. We'll, we are always receive you however, in conflict, but, um, you know, you can never leave the hotel. <laughs> you, you, you will get away. And I think this is what I'm suggesting for um, both for the United States and, um, well, Europe is just an adjunct to the United States. Um, but it's also the case even, I mean, for Russia, it's not so easy to get out of this conflict either. Um, but the main thing um, that I was trying to raise in this is my experience of sort of negotiations. I've done many ceasefire negotiations and hostage negotiations uh, as well at, at times on behalf of governments. And um, I, my experience of this is, is, is two things. That is that the West um, tends to approach from a very literal from a very, uh, if you like, Western perspective of um, uh, logic, of rationality. Sees, you know, and they say to me, and I remember so often people would come and say, you know, but why don't they you know, understand that violence is just not serving their cause? Why can't they just stop and, you know, come to terms with the other side and that it is um, just really so simple? So throughout the time when I was um, working on these negotiators coming in from Washington and would sit down and say, well, you know, back in the envelope, you know, here's the five points. Do we agree on this? Okay, it's done. You know, and back on the plane, back to Washington. And, you know, the point was that um, conflict actually changes psychology, the psyche. The longer it goes on, the more it changes, it ratchets, it ratchets. And this sort of very, if you like, uh, rationalistic approach to conflict, you know, here's a spectrum of power. At one end is this part, at that end is that part, let's split it here, and that's the solution. But it doesn't take account to, I mean, what I call consciousness or, or psyche. Uh, people it may seem sensible politically and rational to come to the solution that is being proposed, but it not, may not be psychologically acceptable, even though it is, if you like, politically rational. 
so to do. So what who have experienced losses, loved ones, family, imprisonments, who've been abused, who've been treated badly over many years, become very, I mean, it's, it's a different world, a different psyche, different world that they, they live in. And, you know, this is why I used to see these, you know, people used to think that they were extremists or Islamists, radicals or something. In fact, many of them were just secular sort of um, medical students who had struck a suicide belt and exploded. They just wanted to hurt the other side. Mm. So I think really, I mean, this article was looking at two things. Mm. One is my experience that when it comes to negotiation, now at the moment, you know, the West is sort of in a binary system. On the one hand, it says, you know, okay, let's have a negotiation frozen conflict. We'll freeze the thing as it is, and we'll negotiate the whole point of getting more territory so that we can put pressure and Russia will join frozen conflict, and then we can allow Ukraine to join NATO in due course. We can build up the security guarantees, which are effectively sort of a renaturalization of Ukraine. And then the other one is really, okay, no, that won't. let's just keep the war going. Keep it going, maybe at a lower end, but let's keep the war going because the longer we trip Russia, it will collapse and, and uh, be it. And my point is, they haven't even reached the sort of starting point for real negotiations mm -hmm. from these positions. There's such sort of, you know, Western-style positions that are reached inside the Western Beltway bubble, you know, of what we would like to offer Russia, that this will be what we will offer. And they do this, and I think you've made this point before, Alexander, so it's not new to you. Uh, I've heard it was very much my experience. They do this and they don't have any real understanding of what's going on. They don't understand, unless I come back to it again, how the psyche in Russia is changed by war. It's not just the rational perception, but the psyche has changed. And Russians, you know, now really want to uh, have a sort of impulse they want to see if you like, um, the regime in Kiev, they want to see a defeat um, on this. And this is, you know, you may say it's not very rational, but that is the reality of negotiations in, 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 in my experience, that they can't, you know, they haven't done their homework. They don't, and we have much worse situation because uh, the West is stuck in this delusion about Russia being a uh, uh, a, a state that is on the verge of collapse and it, 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 it is weak. Mm -hmm. So they haven't really started to think about that or even to try to calculus. What it is Russia might accept. There is a hidden assumption behind all this, oh, whatever we offer, when we come to the conclusion, mm -hmm. Macron and Scholz say, oh, well, we'll say this to, 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 to Putin. And then Putin will grab it with both hands and say, oh, thank you very much for your, for your contribution. And I think, you know, I've often seen, I mean, this is particularly evident to me, sorry, I'll stop in a second, but I just wanted to make this clear. The second point is really the firm in doing hostage things. I mean, where you, you know, you're, you're not in a position to hold long conversations, you're doing it over radio or something like this with hostage takers who are ready to cut the throats of the person they're holding, and the things like that. Um, you know, the governments have come to me often and said, can you open a channel to these people? This is basically what all, this is where we are with you. All they're saying is, let's open a channel with Russia. And I keep saying in these hostage negotiations, I keep saying, I can open a channel, but what are you going to say? Mm -hmm. You know, what you're going to say, and what are you going to say when they say no? I mean, when you, you know, 
you have to be a bit like a chess player. You may not be as good as that, but you need to think, where are you going to go um, if, um, if, it's not going, if it's not going to happen? And I, I set out in the article the, the, the principal reasons why it's not going to happen like that is because um, it's quite obvious um, that the of the ultra-nationalists and the neo-fascists. You see this, I mean, you know, Zelensky's 10-point plan, which calls for the capitulation of Russia, is a typical example mm. where you don't have to negotiate with. So those are the those are the essential points. They don't really have them thought through how to negotiate. My experience, it may take them some time to think out how to negotiate. But in the meantime, you know, Russia has agency. Russia has forces. They don't even put into the equation the fact that you know, Russia in the next weeks or so may indeed change the whole paradigm of this, of this conflict. And they haven't even thought about going into it as a first stage, let alone thought about how to manage it as a paradigm. I mean, there's a, a chronic lack of actually sort of understanding these things. And that's what I was trying to express in this article. I have to say, I think it is an absolutely brilliant article, if I may just quickly say. And I thought the, uh, the point about yeah. Hotel California, Hotel Ukraine, is... Well, it's, it's very insightful because what has happened is that there's been this long discussion about Ukraine. That's gone, it's gone on for, de for years, essentially since the Soviet Union broke up, about what to do with Ukraine. And people in the West, governments in the West, have for far too long, and still now, they haven't really thought through the fact that this is a very complicated relationship between Ukraine and Russia. And one would have thought that before getting involved in a country like Ukraine, which has been a part of Russia, the Russian Empire, the Russian, uh, the Soviet Union for 300 years, where there's all these enormously connected relationships between Russia and Ukraine, economic, social, familial, you would have thought, that they would tread very carefully before going into Ukraine. They never did. They went straight in. They took very, um, very strong declaratory positions. They still do. They still talk about supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes. That's become a kind of mantra that they're now endlessly repeating. And, of course, that isn't really going to help you if you find yourself in the kind of situation in which you are in now, where you're involved in an intractable conflict, it's not working out as you expect. And it strikes me that you're absolutely right. They haven't really even started to think about what the Russian side is going to, is going is, is thinking, what it's going to do, how its own perspective is evolving. I just wanted to make Quickly, two points just before we come back. The first is that the rational solution that you're talking about, to me, is very similar to the Minsk agreement. <laughs> you know, grant these people autonomy in those days. I mean, it was always entirely about granting not just the whole of Don, not the whole of Donbass, these territories that were under the control of the people who were, who, you know, engage in those uprisings. Um, back in 2014, grant them autonomy, agree some kind of constitutional setup for Ukraine. Minsk made no reference to NATO, by the way, just to say, or no reference to the EU, nothing of that kind. And we're now perhaps thinking about returning to something like that, completely ignoring that a whole lot of things have happened since. There's been a terrible war, which is still ongoing. Emotion has increased investment on the russian side has increased going back to minsk is not going to be or, or anything like minsk is simply not going to happen and the second thing which i also have to say i was thinking about again when i was reading your article was that it reminded me so much of what happened in syria 
and a place I know I think you know very well, in 2016, the Russians intervened in Syria, and there was these very complex negotiations between the Americans and the Russians that went on for about a year. And the Americans were putting forward all kinds of proposals to the Russians, which never really addressed, from a Russian point of view, their primary concern, which is the stability of the government in Damascus. And the result was that the negotiations, in the end, failed. And the Russians just went ahead and supported Assad. And in the end, basically, they swept the board. And it seems that we've are repeating in Ukraine something of the same mistake. We're not looking to address the concerns of the other side. We're talking all the time to ourselves. We are negotiating, in effect, with ourselves. We're not really thinking about what the other side is looking at. Yes, I think that is so, but I, I, I want to say because I think, you know, you have to look at it at two levels. One is the sort of geostrategic, the geopolitical level, mm -hmm. which is consuming the European attention completely. Treat Ukraine as a sort of um, separate, as a single entity. And I, I, I suggest to Britain that, you know, that they ought to think of it more like Ireland. Do you have the same problems? And I mean, I, as a very young, um, rather naive diplomat at that time, I remember, you know, we thought it was a good idea to put the two sides in the room together and tell them to sort it out. And then we sort it out. Of course, it was a complete failure, total failure. In a way, convinced of the other side's in <laughs> agreement in capacity, shall we say. Um, and the point is, you know, you start off with one side that has an understanding and interpretation of history. It has a vision of the future. It has a completely different cultural background. And on the other side, a completely incompatible vision of history and a vision of the future for, for Ireland. And so long, if you like, in Ireland, to try and get to the point, not of an agreement, but simply to the point where one side says, well, look, I don't agree with their history, I don't agree with their vision of the future, but I now accept they have a point and they are authentic representatives of, of those people. And no one has understood this in terms of, of, of what is going on in Ukraine, but you have the same thing there. And you have on one side, which we're supposed to endorse and back, you know, form of ultranationalism. You know, I won't say much about this here, but I mean, it is one of those ultranationalism. I've been dealt with ultranationalism in the Middle East. I mean, that simply, I mean, I suppose, if you like, some of the extreme Salafists are uh, ultranationalists in the sense they see most of the world as apostates, i.e. not proper Muslims, and that therefore it is their duty to kill them. Mm. But there is a, a very strong sense uh, of the other side's vision and history uh, of the territory which they jointly share, um, but of wanting to rid completely of what they see as the foreign, unacceptable alien implant into that country. And, I, and because we've been allied so much, um, certainly through American intelligence services, with one aspect of this, I think it makes it much more difficult for them really to come to an understanding of this problem. When Russia says finally comes, when Macron and Scholz, I mean, they don't come. It has to be the United States, the Europe. They don't care what in Moscow what Charles Macron say. I think actually they knew Macron is having less influence in Europe than Lithuania at these times. But I mean, they don't. But they are never going to accept a frozen conflict or a separation that leaves an ultranationalist um, um, neo-fascist, which is predominant. There is a military on the other side, which is also getting fed up with uh, what they see as this 
you know, the nonsense from NATO doctrines and how to operational struggles ahead. So that, uh, there is a uh, there is, if you like, uh, a great difficulty that Zelensky is caught between the two. But you can see, for the time being, he cannot escape um, the far right. They they effectively control. And you saw you see this in all his statements from his supporters and and that ten point peace plan. So these, I mean, really, you know, are things that take a lot of time to get to the point where you can actually have a conversation about uh, about these. And uh, I just think, you know, particularly in, 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 in Washington at the moment, where it's sort of torn apart um, by, you know, political turmoil at home and differing views within their own sort of about how to deal with it. It's going to be very difficult to see really uh, how it actually comes by. It may make political sense, but it doesn't make psychological uh, sense. I thought that um, yeah, the well, the Ukrainian seems to have been at uh, with a, had a bit of a dilemma because on one hand they recognize that this is a war of attrition where they they shouldn't exhaust their manpower and their equipment. But at the same time, it looks like, yeah, they have to conquer new territories at any cost in order for NATO to continue sending weapons. So uh, in this dilemma, it seems that Zelensky went with the territory and support from the West. But uh, this, uh, yeah, as you also pointed out in your article, is not hasn't been that popular, uh, especially by, among Solushny, who has been a bit critical of wasting all of these uh, soldiers. So I, I, I thought, yeah, that this... Was I think he'd be... I think he'd be. I think he'd be called a traitor by those hard right forces if he tried to try to negotiate or do anything except keep open the process. You know, the, the 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 national forces in Ukraine are not content with just getting the land back. I mean, they're hoping to bring Europe to the point at which it concurs with them that it's necessary to destroy Russia. Um, and, you know, this is not really ever sort of brought forward into how do we deal with this. But uh, for the, until Zelensky um, moves, until Zelensky has another, um, if you like, influence on him, he is going to be very much caught um, uh, by that. And for the time being, he's... he's for the time being, Zelensky seems to be trapped you know, by, by uh, all sides, by the military who doesn't want to go on with the war because they're losing too many people, and then by the far right who says, you dare give up the war and you're a traitor and you'll face the consequences. So, I mean, you know, is the United States capable of dealing with that uh, internal political nuts? how to resolve that internal process as a precursor to the beginning of some sort of political solution. And at the moment, I don't see that they even understand it's a problem. <laughs> I mean, they just see it as, you know, that's how it is. And we've always supported those people of the right and they're part of the government. And whatever Zelensky, whatever the government says, that's our policy and they decide what is the outcome of this war. But it's interesting that people seem to have forgotten about 2019 in the West because uh, Zelensky at one point, he did attempt to abide by this Minsk agreement. After he won the presidency, he actually went to the front line in Zolote uh, as the right-wing militias refused then to pull back their heavy weapons. And what was interesting is the whole encounter was caught on tape and went viral in, in Ukraine in which he even pleaded that they would respect his authority. You know, he said, I'm not a loser, I'm a president of Ukraine, you know, you have to listen to me. Uh, but not only did they refuse to follow his orders, they even threatened his life. I mean, if you look at members of parliament, they threatened him. Dmitry Yarosh from uh, right sector threatened his life. Andriy Biletsky as well also threatened him. <coughs> but what was interesting then is they weren't held accountable, they weren't arrested for threatening the president. Instead, we saw that he had to embrace the far right. Yarosh, who had threatened his life, he became advisor to the commander-in-chief 
of the Ukrainian armed forces. You had Bielecki only three weeks ago. Uh, he post uh, Zelensky posted on a photo with uh, Bielecki and put it on the internet. Uh, this is the same guy who yeah, again threatened Zelensky and said he would Ukraine's goal was to lead the white race in a war against the Russians. And it's just uh, it, it it seems. Uh, that in 2019, the Americans might have been able to influence some of this uh, by by putting their full weight behind Zelensky. But but these days, oh. is it too late? Uh, yeah, it's too late for that now. Unless it was, I mean, I think there are two things that will change this calculus, probably. But you're right. But I mean, actually, if you look carefully, all his bodyguards, all Zelensky's bodyguards, are from the far right. He has no freedom. I mean, of movement, everything he says, what he's doing is monitored um, by the far right, and they keep him under a careful, a careful watch. Two things change, may change to uh, change, the, I think, the paradigm. One is we may see um, turmoil within the Kiev sphere, that the military and the far right will, um, will engage in some sort of conflict, violent or whatever, because I think the military are coming to the end, because the military understand, I think, better than the Pentagon, you know, it's not just about weapons and money. I mean, you know, if you run out of the sort of experienced manpower, I mean, you know, you can be given more weapons and money, but you just can't mount an effective military operation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they know that that they're running out of experienced men. I mean, they've run out of experienced men. They know that they don't have the weapons or the um, uh, or the missiles in order to change the, the war in a strategic way at all. Um, and so I think they are very much at odds with the right position. No, we must continue until Russia breaks and Putin is gone. I mean, that hard line is very much opposed by the military. So either we're going to see, I think, a breakup in Kiev um, and turn and maybe a new government or, or a vacuum. Who knows? No one knows. Well, that's what I meant about is not easy for Russia. Thing is, I mean, all the reports that uh, I hear, I think Alexander has made reference to, all the reports suggest that I mean, uh, Russia has been, first of all, building up their logistics supplies, and then when that has been sorted, they've been building up uh, the size of their armed forces. And they now have really uh, a massive, shall we say, massive resource, military resource. They've been building up these uh, law conscripts, the conscripts were there, but the conscripts are being put into a sort of contractual basis, just as Wagner was about to be. And, and so they have um, uh, <coughs> now a, a large force. I don't believe it will take um, the... You remember that the Russia says, I think it was Putin, very early on in the war, and said, you know, you must understand, we have the technical ability to bring um, Ukraine to a stop. I mean, he meant by the progressive destruction, nutrition of logistics capabilities, of electricity, mm. of information to be passed on. Uh, you know, it's still amazing to me that the internet and all of those facilities are allowed to continue to work in, in, in the past of Ukraine. Uh, as you know, Russia is capable of cutting down, uh, stopping the internet and keeping their own internal internet um, function at the same time to interfere uh, with NATO's vaunted, you know, uh, ISR, the, the satellite surveillance system. Um, they can probably stop Starlink. Um, uh, they've tried it and seem to have succeeded in it. Um, but they don't do this. Now, I think at some point you may, they may decide when um, the Ukrainian forces have been sufficiently exhausted, they will, will do it. I don't think it needs necessarily 
And I don't think it would suit Putin to thousands dead as a result of their um, offensive. I think it would be a combination of, um, uh, what was it, an embrace of Ukraine that actually brings it to the sort of paralysis, like a sort of python snake, sort of slowly winding around you and then <clears throat> squeezing till the breath goes out of you, um, rather than a sort of, uh, necessarily a sort of, um, you know, what a big arrows. Okay. I mean, this is speculation. Not, I mean, Russia is very good at making sure we don't know what they're going to do next. And whatever it is, it's a big price, I'm sure. Can I just ask you um, uh, to think about a possibility, which is this, which is that the Russians, as you rightly say, I mean, I'm hearing the same thing, that they're building up their forces, they're building up more aircraft, they're increasing the shell production, they're, they're conscripting more people, they're training more people, they're taking out contracts with more people, but they're still playing it, as exactly as you said, in a very, very measured way. Could it be that the Russians are doing this precisely in order to give more space for a possible negotiation, for somebody to come forward from the West with a proposal that they can work with, that they're in effect waiting for the West to see, you know, we, you know we're, we're going to be, we're going to get ourselves ready in a few months, but until then, Let's see whether the Americans, whether the, well, let's see whether the Europeans will finally come to their senses and make a coherent proposal. Because again, this is not unlike the what the sort of thing that the Russians tend to do. At least that's that's my own experience. That and and would that mean, if that were the case, that perhaps there is still space for a negotiation? I was suggested that this autumn might be the last real opportunity to do that? Well, I, you know, I, I've always said that from the Putin's perspective, this is primarily, again, I come back to the term, but it's a psychological. It is primarily intended to force an exit by the West from their sort of position of exceptionalism and the uh, um, uh, 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 adoption of a sort of hegemonic, hegemonic view of the world and to sort of push them out of that uh, view. And we see aspects, of, you know, we tend to be too much focused on the military, I think, because there's such good commentary from military people that we, we sort of look at it very much in, in a military way. But, you know, Putin is playing a very complicated game. He's, the diplomacy has been very adept at bringing China on the line and bringing India. The BRICS was an incredible sort of geostrategic uh, uh, achievement. But ultimately, the aim is to get back to the position, as he said uh, more than a year ago in December, where he put down uh, the, those two draft treaties. And the whole point is how to push, you know, the West to the point that it really does. Now, I know the French foreign minister has just said some sort of words, but, you know, when they get a call from Washington, <laughs> it'll change quick enough. Um, so I think he, he is very much concerned about that. I think the second thing he's very much concerned about is what I borrowing someone else's expression, um, the fragile American psyche. Mm. How do you sort of continue this squeeze on the West to bring about an exit from their delusions about themselves, their delusions that they're the best and the only power in the world? How do you push them out of that without actually allowing them to go to the point where they say, oh my God, you know, 9-11, Pearl Harbor. And, and this is the real danger, and I agree with others who say this, because, I mean, it's quite clear the West doesn't have any game-changing weapons 
uh, that um, that will you know that Russia can't match on the field at all. Are they going to at some point then sort of say, well, you know, because there are plenty of new cons in mean, advocating it? Well, you know, don't you know? Putin's bluffing on the nuclear score. It's all bluff. He doesn't really mean it. We'll just use the small nuclear edge to him. Oh, we'll turn it down. It won't be bigger than a. We won't, won't be bigger than a big conventional weapon. Why not? And you know, then he'll get the message, and then he'll sit down and he'll. He will capitulate to to us. And you know, again, I I think it's a reflection that the Americans don't. You know, don't look at themselves in the mirror. They don't see how weak they really are. They still see themselves as a sort of, there may be sort of anxieties, mm. but they still see themselves. We are the biggest country in the world. It's the most technically advanced. We have the best weaponry in the world. There's nothing to sort of compare it with. Well, actually, all of that's changed. That whole strategic paradigm doesn't work anymore. They've been overtaken, technically. They've been overtaken in their military doctrine. They've been overtaken in the sense that, you know, their weapons actually haven't worked very well on the ground. I mean, it's worked. Uh, uh, Russian weapons have objectively proved um, effective uh, in this conflict um, than the American ones. So they don't look at themselves very much, but I think this is a point. So Alexander, your, your, your question. No, this is, what we're, this is what Putin's aim is to get to the point at which, but it, let's be clear about what the, the, the negotiation has to be about. It has to be with the United States, forget Europe. It has to be with the United States, and it has to be about the relation that, that uh, an understanding that as, if you like, Eurasia and its security grows, this, uh, if you like, the Eurasian security structure, we need a modus vivendi with Western security structure. You know, we can't go on with the sort of messy incrementalism of, of the West. We are building a huge security and trading structure across Eurasia, how do we get to the point at which we can that security structure and how to live with what are the Western needs and Western vital interest in security in the area? Now, so, Alexander, I agree with you. It, 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 eventually, this is, you know, what Putin is aiming to. The only thing is that if you look at Washington, you don't see the slightest sort of sense that they even understand the, you know, the, the problem, let alone have a, a proper answer to that. But, and it's not just Russia, Russia and the others in the BRICS. I mean, are evolving a security structure. We see it evolving across the Middle East already. Look what's happening. There's a, you know, we find that the, you know, the Gulf states are joining with Iran in a Gulf naval patrol protection policies. And things like this are happening very, very rapidly. It'll happen, it'll unroll in the next period. But this is really what we have to be talking about, is this, um, how do these two things switch? And I don't think, you know, it's not just, Ukraine is just one you know, part of this. It's a financial war, it's a cultural war, it is a war of civilization, and of course it's a military one too in Ukraine. But the military one in Ukraine is only is subordinate to, I think, Russia and China's bigger objective of, of trying to find some form of modus vivendi within within between the Eurasian security needs and Western Security. But I, I think what you touch on is uh, it's been to some extent a challenge of Russia for the past 30 years, which was at the end of the Cold War to find a, a new format for Europe, which was not based on the same zero sum logic of the Cold War, uh, where 
uh, well, effectively, well, NATO expands, it ends up being at the expense of, of Russian security. But uh, I guess what really changed was in 2014 with uh, when we backed the coup in, in Ukraine, because uh, until then, Russia had a very Western-centric foreign policy. Its objectives were largely defined by this ambition to be, have a greater Europe, which would be absent of this zero-sum dynamic. But since 2014, again, this this option is now gone. Uh, now they're seeking this huge Eurasian integration. And it seems to some extent the challenge becomes even greater because now this huge Eurasian... Even greater. Yeah, this Eurasian... Eurasian and, you know, in a sense, I think what you were saying about, you know, the Cold War and the talk about European security update, you know, that's passé. I mean, it's, it's stale. I mean, you know, that subject. I mean, you know, Sweden comes in or Finland or whatever, but, you know, there's nothing really that's going to change this whole mega argument that is, is being, the proposition being put forward by Russia and China and, and with the other BRIC states in, in that respect. And, and so, you know, it's got to be understood in a slightly broader perspective now that this is, you know, not just Europe, it's Eurasia. And there is a security and the BRICS will likely sort of converge and commingle in due course. Um, but, it, you know, and, it, and that's part of it. It's the financial war. I mean, that's another aspect of it, to push the West to understand. If they don't understand it in Ukraine, they're getting more pressure both in terms of they're getting pressure in terms of de-dollarization and consequences of that. They're getting pressure in Syria now where they're being under uh, um, considerable you know, um, forces that are pushing for their removal to, to leave Syria. I mean, that's a very dangerous aspect because it, it could easily explode into something much wider, a regional war. Um, so we're in very sort of uncertain territory, and there is too much, I think, really in some of this, there's too much fluidity in this. There's not enough, and, you know, I mean, I don't know that the White House has got the ability, you know, they can't even sort out their intelligence on Ukraine, let alone try to get it out, you know, what Eurasian security needs and Eurasian structures are going to mean economically, financially, as well as uh, in many fields on trade and on setting of standards for the next era of, of, the, of the globe. I mean, at the moment, uh, you know, America is engaged in, in an attempt to do what it did to, I think uh, someone has made the point before, what it, it did to Japan. They're now doing it to China, albeit in a different way, adding everything bit to lists of you know, national security interests. And you can't trade with this. You can't do this. You can't do that. More regulations, more tariffs. And, and it's, the danger is that it's succeeding. I mean, you know, it, uh, uh, China, for the moment, is, is slowing. It's vitally important, I think, to the welfare of the United States as to Europe that this should not happen and that, you know, that they be allowed to reorientate in very careful years about how to restructure the Chinese economy for the future in a different way from the Western way. And that needs sort of strategic space to move it you know, trading space, not just security, but security and trade come together. I mean, half, which I think has been little sort of noticed, I mean, half of the BRICS expansion was all about getting these pivots, these choke points on trade around, around the world. It wasn't just about, you know, de-dollarization. It was a strategic geopolitical look at the prospects of security for the whole of the Eurasian, the heartland, if you like, go back to McKinley, the heartland strategy. Because, uh, I'm very interested because, I mean, when Americans talk about the conflict with Ukraine, and there was this extraordinary commentary by this new Republican 
politician Vivek Ramaswamy, who's just emerged out of nowhere. But he was a, he was a good example of what I find is the general trend. You you don't actually have people in Washington who are prepared to talk about a general peaceful settlement of you know the entire global situation. Uh, 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 a ceasefire. So Ramaswamy says, "I want peace in Ukraine. I want to do this deal with the Russians so that I can detach the Russians." from the Chinese, and I can focus on pushing back hard on the Chinese. So it is essentially a conflict between those people in the United States who want to confront China, and they're a large group, and another group who still want to confront Russia, who I suspect include to a certain extent the president himself, who is, let's be clear about this, somebody who's lived all his life through the Cold War, who's very Eurocentric in his own way. He tends to think very much, it seems to me, along the lines that people thought in the 1970s when he first became a senator and the 1980s, when it was all about Europe. But anyway, that's what it's all about. It's all about either we go after the Russians or we go after the Chinese or some people who still want to go after both of them at the same time. But it's never about actually finding a long-term, sustainable, peaceful relationship with all of them. And this has become not just sterile, but ultimately very dangerous. Exactly. It is very dangerous. And I mean, you know, again, you know, this sort of, Beltway discussion it has no real basis in, in reality, because as I go back to what I said at the outset, um, the war has seared the consciousness of Russia. There is no way they're coming back into the Western or the American sphere, at least for a generation. I mean, it has really seared them. It's not, and they. The, it's misunderstood and call Putin all these names and everything which they do, which is, you know, juvenile, and Russians regard it as juvenile. But, I mean, the point is how they have denigrated Russians and what it means to be Russian, Russian culture, Russia as a, as a whole, Ruskimia, the whole sort of sense, which, you know, I believe the, the West sees it as a sort of you know, simply a mercantilist, the usual West with a mercantilist view. But it's holistic. All the, the, the culture, the economic, the sort of sense of the people as a whole, the spiritual side of it, the orthodoxy, all of this is sort of conflates into a single, in, into a single uh, portion. And I think that is what um, you know, they just refuse to accept. So the idea that they're going to break off Russia to fight China, I mean, it's just la la stuff. It's just ridiculous. They're not going to do that. But what they are doing is driving China more and more with an only an expansion and a major expansion, financial as well as security expansion of, of the Eurasian landmass is the only answer. To, to the United States that is pulled in this direction, pulled in this, it has got this idea, that idea, and the uh, uh, White House it doesn't seem to be able to decide which it wants. Now, I think the only thing that will maybe shift this a little bit is, and I, I put it at the end, I, I, you know, you can argue it in, in different ways. It looks as if, it looks as if we might be moving towards an impeachment process, inquiry, not a, an impeachment per se, but an impeachment inquiry um, uh, 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 aimed at um, Biden. Now, inevitably, once the Congress gets dug into an impeachment inquiry, I mean, it's all going to be, all the stuff about, you know, um, Ukraine is going to come out from the corruption, and there's plenty more to come out. I mean, we all remember what happens about those cryptocurrency, FTX or whatever it was, who was somehow circulating um, cryptocurrencies and then providing support back in Washington. 
I mean, there's a lot more to come out. I just think the DNC at a point will say, for God's sake, let's, you know, let's do something to move on from from all of the sort of deep mess in this that is the great messiness, not in a military sense, but in a sense of the, the, the nexus between, you know, Biden and the United States and Ukraine, which is wholly corrupt, and we all know how corrupt it is. Uh, but I don't think they'll want that washing parade, washing hung out to, um, obviously, during the lead up to these, if we have elections, the, the 24. So um, I do think that, I don't know how, but I think this is going to either make a bigger sort of impact on the public, which is going to push the Republicans, uh, the uni party part of the Republicans towards a more view about continuing the war in Ukraine, or it's going to bring about some sort of bigger sort of crisis in, 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 in the United States as these things come up. It's unforeseeable. It's just, but all one can see is, I mean, it gets worse and worse and worse, the tensions in the United States, and there's no obvious sort of remedy to those either. Sadly. But it seems that uh, some of the Republicans, uh, definitely not all, probably not even the majority, they appear to feel that uh, Ukrainian failure, that they could uh, blame it on Biden and uh, again pin it as a democratic failure or on the Democrat Party instead of being an American failure. But uh, e even if um, the support begin to diminish within the United States, I was just curious what 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 would be the leeway in for Russia's bargaining position? Like I know, in ter my impression of some of the territorial issues, they would be willing to compromise. For example, the the region of Zaporozhye and Kherson, which is on the uh, western side of the Dnieper, they might want to be willing to discuss changing the administrative borders, given that they don't actually hold these ter territories. But but beyond this, uh, would they have any? What, what would be the scope of the bargaining? Because, as you pointed out, a ceasefire. The scope of the bargaining. Sorry, because the scope of the bargaining. Yeah. Hmm? Say that again, sir. No, sorry. Just because the so I missed your last sentence. Yeah, sorry. No, well, the, because the ceasefire doesn't seem to be as uh, reasonable proposition as you also pointed out in the article. It effectively just means that. You know, they would see that as the West simply rearming and, you know, fighting another day. So uh, is, would the only acceptable thing for Russia then be regime change in Kiev, given that, uh, well, they, they can't live with this current government and, uh, uh, well, they would have to have some kind of reassurance that Ukraine would remain neutral and that Western weapons would stop flowing? Uh, or is, is there no room for bargaining? Well, I think I think arguably, really, from a position more or less of capitulation um, on, on the part of, of Kiev, um, because of the the, the, fa the factors that will have to go into it. I mean, the first, as I've said, I keep and I keep going. There would have to be a change in the character and quality of governance in Kiev. It can't, you know. There's no point. Russia is simply not ex going to accept any sort of possibility of rearming or um, continuing with the far right control and set the limits uh, of policy um, in uh, in Kiev. So there would have to be a change in the quality, whatever that means. Whatever the, however you, I don't know what the Russians. Would, would say exactly about that, but there would have to be a change of that. Then there would have to be some sort of understanding um, that the Russians are never going to leave the Donbass to be exposed again, uh, as it has been from 2014 onwards, and you know, being shelled regularly um, by the Ukrainian armed forces. How do you address, I mean, these are the real, this is where I go back to the island question. And, you know, you've got two peoples living on one territory that have quite different cultural visions of the future and their past. How are you going to deal with that? 
And that is going to be, I think, probably um, the, the end result, however it comes about, perhaps from an implosion in Kiev, but will be the run of the Dnieper. First of all, move to the Dnieper and take the, the land to the, to the river Dnieper. And then um, when it's got to the Dnieper, I think it will pause. And uh, as you, you ask this question, I think they will not sort of try and go to the ultimate of this, but they may pause at the Dnieper and say, well, West, have you got something to say that is constructive about how to deal with this? Because otherwise we will need then a, a if you like, a from the Dnieper for the extent of the weapons you give to the Ukrainians or the Ukrainians still have. If they have, you know, 50 mile missiles, we'll have to go to 60 miles. If they have 60 miles, we'll go to 70. But we are not going to have uh, Donbass, Munas, um, civilian schools, civilian buildings regularly bombarded by Ukrainian um, uh, military equipment. Even if, you know, effectively um, the Ukrainian state iterates itself in Lvov or down in the south and uh, operates from there. We don't know what will be the outcome of this, but if it does that, then what, you know, um, what will be, the Russians undoubtedly will need to have some very clear understandings about the internal situation of Ukraine, quite apart from understandings of the of the bigger geopolitical, geostrategic point. I mean, I have to say straight away, I cannot imagine that from a Russian point of view, a peace agreement is going to be possible, which doesn't address the fundamental issue, not just of the security of Donbass, but of the security of Russia as a whole. And I think this is something that I think a lot of people in the West simply don't understand. We come back to those two treaties that the Russians proposed back in December 2021, and which, to all intents and purposes, the United States showed no interest in negotiating about the substance of, the, of those treaties. I absolutely think that the Russians, if they get to the Dnieper, will want to stop there. I don't think they want to go all the way to Lvov. I think they understand perfectly well no. that they would have lots of problems if they went to Lvov. But I think what people in the West also need to understand is that if the Russians feel that their own security, the security not just of Donbass, but, you know, the whole of the Western Russia and beyond Western Russia cannot be preserved unless they go further west still, beyond the Dnieper, I think eventually they will do that. They've now shown repeatedly that when they say that they will take steps to ensure their security, that, you know, they're not bluffing. And I've, I have to say, all this constant commentary that you see that, well, you know, what the Russians are doing is a bluff, that, you know, all these things that the Russians are saying is, if, if it was a bluff, we wouldn't be where we are. And I don't think there's any understanding of this in the West, and to the extent that there still is an understanding of this, I think that people in London especially, but also a lot of people in Washington, would be viscerally opposed to it. And I sometimes worry that they would rather see a debacle, a military debacle in Ukraine, any disaster there then come to that kind of sustainable solution with the Russians, which will, of course, freeze the front lines, if you like, the, you know, the new Cold War lines further and harden them indefinitely and would make for a very, very bad security situation in Europe going forward into, you know, the far future. Uh, I I agree absolutely. As I say to you, I mean, what I said was after going to the Nipah, you just need to know Faza. I mean, you know, there has to be an agreement, there'll be no artillery, or, or that if there is artillery, that it will be destroyed by the Russians. But you're quite right. I mean, it goes back to the whole point, I mean, that where is the security needs Russia. 
Now, where I think people are missing this uh, is two, the second part of this, and they don't grasp it. What was the first line of attack on Russia? It was financial. America launched its financial war and took it out, the banks out of SWIFT and sanctioned it, and it was. And you had the French finance ministers saying, oh, we are going to collapse the currency, we're going to collapse Russia. And Europe was one of the greatest intelligence failures of this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, they told the Europeans, it's easy, we will put the sanctions on Russia and it will be collapsed. And, you know, in six months, you'll be back to having cheap natural gas from, from Russia and, you know, they'll be eating out of your hand and you can take what raw materials you want. And they believed, and they made a grievous mistake, which is put in jeopardy the economic future of Europeans. Um, and I, I think that what people don't understand is that this, this is the other war that has been going on, the excessive weaponization of the dollar, what happened uh, to Japan, what has happened to Russia, and what is happening now as we speak to China. I mean, and the Chinese understand that, you know, it's not the same financial war that was unleashed on Russia, and the one in Japan was quite different, it was an interest rate war, and, but they are having this rate cutting of key materials. Actually, what it's likely to do, in my view, is actually drive us into a depression, because you know, if all these states stop functioning economically, if Russia, which is slowing now, is not because of a property speculative boom, they'll sort that out, but it is slowing because it doesn't export as much. That's where employment is. That's where ordinary Chinese work is in manufacturing, not in, you know, speculative, you know, Goldman Sachs and these camps. It's, it's, it's not there. So this is you know, as essential, existential to Chinese security. So Russia and Chinese security, you know, is interlocked in the sense of the financial war as well as the wider security of, you know, they believe in the real economy and they're trying to build out real corridors, real transport, real manufacturing across the Eurasia and Africa, and to leave Europe to um, to, to fester in its uh, own, uh, own, uh, own, of its own making. So, uh, I mean, I don't think this is, you know, we still haven't grasped the big, the bigger geostrategy that is going on here, which is, you know, Russia and China facing the same problem. Mm -hmm. India is worried about the same problem. All of these states, even Saudi Arabia and UAE, worry about the same problem because in, in that sort of weaponization of the financial world. So they're all coming together. And they are building up, secondly, a new cultural paradigm uh, on, on terms of, um, you know, of not only of, of self-autonomy and of sovereignty, as much as one can, but in the sense, and it's now suddenly taken off as a powerful anti-colonial movement uh, backlash in, in Africa. So, I mean, this thing has got the mix to it. And, you know, I, uh, I'm sorry to say, you know, we talk about the closed mind of the American, who was it, Bloom, who wrote the book about the American closed mind. Actually, the problem is in Europe and America, it's the corridor mind. They can't get out of this one corridor of thinking that they've been in since the Cold War. And they can't sort of move on from that and see it as a, you know, we can forget McKinder. This is a new edition of McKinder that is taking change of credit. I think you're spot on with the. Um the reference to the assumption that we could get back to the deal with uh, cheap Russian energy, because in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, uh, there was an impression that Russia, to some extent, used its relationship with the East almost to increase its own market value 
uh, in its path towards uh, the West to become part of this greater Europe. But but for me, it seems uh, what the Russian, Chinese and others are working on is similar to what uh, the United States itself did in the early 19th centuries when it wanted to uh, become less dependent on the Great Britain. Then they had the American system. Again, it had these three pillars. It wanted the manufacturing industry, it developed this transportation uh, infrastructure, and of course, the national bank, these three pillars. And you see that this is kind of the foundation of, I think, what the Russians and Chinese are working on, as well as much of Eurasia. They want this first pillar of technological autonomy, these industries decoupled from the US. They want the second, which is trillions of dollars into this Belt and Road initiatives with new transportation corridors, not vulnerable to the US. And of course, third would be the financial aspect, where you see this BRICS development bank, uh, the SEO uh, trading in uh, their own currency by de-dollarizing, reducing reliance on SWIFT. So there's this, uh, uh, and, and as the economic system shifts, uh, the entire, there's also uh, opportunity to reject the hegemonic world order, which is seen as being encapsulated by this uh, rules-based international order, we call it, which is to a large extent a challenge of international law. But uh, it's, I think this is why the Ukraine crisis becomes so problematic because it's, it's become a symptom of a wider challenge of, I guess, the entire world order, the geoeconomic infrastructure. But, uh, but again, this, uh, this also, makes it more complex, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but also, you know, what Brexit was about is also about neoliberalism and about, you know, the neoliberalism imposition through the Western control over the financial system that meant that countries couldn't produce what they wanted to do with their own crops and their own agriculture. They were forced into doing export um, products like sort of flowers for Europe and strawberries for Europe and things like this in order to earn the fornix to buy American grain. I mean, and, you know, neoliberalism uh, structures, I mean, are part of this um, uh, attempt. And I remember this debate, I don't know if you remember, when, between Z uh, and Putin. And Putin and Z said, you know, the problem was, and what, what caused, we won't go into that, what caused Russia, the Soviet Union, to collapse? And he said, you, you know, you, you lost a belief in your own ideas. And, and that was the consequence. I have to admit, you've done a wonderful job in actually both melding together elements of the market system with a state strategy, with giving it a strength, which we didn't do, and it was a failure. And the net outcome of this, uh, uh, really, the discussion was, yes, I mean, the problem was what happened was China understood in order to survive, it needed to be outside the Western and, um, uh, financial structures. Mm. And that, unfortunately, Russia went the other way and dived into the Western structures. Mm. And that was what brought it down. And it was quite interesting. And Putin said, you're absolutely right. And the understanding that it was actually being within the financial sphere, not I'm talking about sanctions here, I'm not talking about removing people, I'm just talking about the Western hyper-financialized system, which what it does is, it over time, erodes real economy that it employs people, that gives them decent jobs and allows them to buy things in favor of financialized products in, in, instead. I mean, Friedrich List wrote all about this in the end of the 19th century. And, and so, I mean, this is part of this great move, is to produce not just a new culture, but a, a new development model for the world that is a not the hyper-financialized neoliberal model that they have. Because ultimately, as List said, even in the 19th century, overemphasis on consumption you end up without the real economy sufficient to support your own population in work and earning. And of course, the interesting thing about List is that he was heavily influenced by what was happening in the United States at that time. And um, in a sense, 
you can see that Liszt, who was very much the dominant economic thinker in late 19th century Russia, is now actually coming back, I understand. People are actually <laughs> looking at him again. And if I can just talk about this, because, of course, uh, all that you said about the uh, fact that the Russian financial system essentially became the Western financial system, it became the Western branch of it. I had a very close friend, I have a very close friend, who is a Russian banker, and he was making exactly that very same point to me 15 years ago. <laughs> and in fact, what we have steadily seen incrementally, step by step, is Russia moving away from this. So I mean, one of the very first things that uh, 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 happened when Nabulina took over the central bank, which people don't understand, people always think of Nabulina very much as an arch liberal connected to the West. But what she actually did was she closed down lots and lots and lots of Russian banks. And the Russian banking system today that's left is almost entirely state controlled. In, in that respect, it's not very different in some respects from the Chinese. It's, again, a publicly owned banking system. There are still some private banks in Russia, as there are some private banks in China. But they are an insignificant part of the financial system. And you can see also that she took steps with the ruble. Firstly, she made it fully convertible, which was actually a blow at the oligarchic interests in Russia, which wanted a ruble pegged to the dollar at a certain rate, because that was very convenient for them to convert money into dollars whenever they wanted. And it was also the same with Western investors as well, who were able to take money out of Russia at a high ruble exchange rate against the dollar. And she's lowered, she prevented that. And then now steadily, she has been introducing exchange controls and capital controls. And she's taking that further still. And I suspect that before very long, within the next five years, maybe sooner than that, we're going to go into a system where the ruble will cease to be as simply convertible as it has been, especially with this new financial structure, uh, the BRIC structure being constructed, um, which will effectively mean that you can transfer money and funds around the world without having to make your currency convertible in the same way that it was. And again, if you go back to the 19th century, to the United States, you will find that an awful lot of that mirrors what the United States was doing then. So an industrial policy in Russia, aircraft construction, railway construction, te high technology construction, all of those things, with a um, repatriated and in effect nationalized financial system geared once more towards internal economic development. But with the Russians again, like the Chinese, operating it all within a market system where prices are set by supply and demand and not are, are not controlled directly by some kind of central institution which fixes fixes prices. But there is a convergence. This is the point I was going to say. There is a convergence already, and it's been happening for some time, between the Chinese and the Russian economic models. And it is not so different in both cases to what the, was happening in the United States in the 19th century, um, which was a topic, by the way, which decades ago I actually studied. Yeah, and uh, well, I quite agree. I mean, there are, Putin said specifically to see you manage that much better than we have, and we are following your model now. So, I mean, that was an interesting discussion that came out. Why did the Soviet Union um, uh, collapse? But I mean, Friedrich Liss was more um, prominent in the German scene, but of course, uh, Count Sergei Witte. Um, who was Prime Minister and um, is still Tsarist Russia. I mean, he was a close follower of his and wrote books on several lines. So it was embedded thinking from, from, from 
that earlier that earlier point that earlier time. And I, I think you know that we are so at a point of inflection both economically and how things are going, as well as with going through an inflection point in terms of geo strategy and um, uh, and and more than that. I mean I think there is I keep coming back to this word, I, I can't sort of define it, but I think you know, there is a change of consciousness taking place. Uh, you know, it's because, you know, the Western system doesn't even believe consciousness exists. It's only within the mind, you know, um, neurons and, and um, so on. But, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes suddenly things shift. And, again, you know, one can't necessarily explain it. I mean, take power, American power. You know, suddenly you have it, and then suddenly people look at you and are skeptical that you're really as powerful as they thought you to be. And that's what it's facing, I mean, across the world, through the Western narrative, the Western sense of huge power. Uh, it's, not, it's not accepted any longer. People's, you know, it's there until it isn't, and it isn't. That's, yeah, that's why I wanted. That's why I brought up the the American system because it was based on the Hamiltonian economics and Friedrich List as well. Obviously, built on this uh, as well. But what was interesting is uh, the the ideas of Friedrich List. They were republished by in Russia by Sergei Vitin, little pamphlets which were handed out, and they kind of followed this at the end of the nineteenth century. The problem was then you had the communism, and after that you had the nineties where they had this liberal view where pro western only western centric liberal view and they you were right these days they rediscovered sergey vite and but of course in a eurasian context and they see the chinese and it's as if they're taking a they're reading the same book of uh, yeah, Hamil hamilton and uh, vite uh, and uh, friedrich list simply because the, the 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 core of it was largely to extend uh, economics as an anti-hegemonic instrument because the idea would be interdependence have to be measured by the symmetry of interdependence you don't want to be more dependent on the adversary than they are uh, on you so uh, but but a way to diversify this would be first strategic autonomy but uh, i mean to shift the symmetry of dependence but also to diversify economic partnerships and i think this is where the west's opportunity is because in Russia's interest is really to diversify. It doesn't want to be too reliant uh, on China only. I mean, China is the most important partner. It wouldn't go against China, but it, it doesn't want to put all its eggs in one basket. That's why it has to reach out to, to the Arab states, to India. But also, it would have ideally had the West as a partner as well. Now that this is closed off, uh, you know, there would be some interest in 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 working again in the future. But uh, it looks like the, the the politics is getting. And uh, of course, the uh, military conflict now is getting in the way of this uh, old geoeconomic uh, rebalancing in which, uh, again, both Russia and the Europeans especially would have greater economic benefits of, uh, of, of working together instead of avoiding excessive dependence on either America on one side or or Asia on the other, but uh, but but that's very different from saying that we can make the Chinese, no, sorry, that make the Russians abandon this greater Eurasian project and instead come back in, into the Western uh, financial system because that's simply not going to happen, which is why it's a bit extraordinary to listen to this kind of politicians in the US these days, which actually suggest, you know, we'll, we'll promise to take the Russians in if they just turn their backs on China. They don't seem to appreciate the huge shifts which are happening. But um, no, uh, anyways, let's put a... I mean, you know, the point you're making and that I think you know, is very, very clear and very right. You know, the structural contradictions in the Western financial systems have now been allowed to get so great that there's no easy solution, there's no solution. And that we will, first of all, have to go through some form of financial crisis as a catharsis. And out of that catharsis, I would not be surprised if we go back to something of the 19th or looking more about you know, strategic. I mean, you know, even then it was quite clear that Adam Smith was overdoing the invisible hand and that 
you know, individualism had its point, but it could be taken too far. And I think much of the world is moving in that direction, mm. and it will affect us. And we'll probably start. I mean, you even had a bit of this um, uh, under, amazingly, Boris Johnson, when he was talking about some sort of strategic uh, you know, plan for the economy. We need some sort of strategic plan. And there were just sort of elements. It wasn't, of course, a coherent one. But, you know, I think the, the, the thing, the, the clearly this model has not worked of dead red consumption because it, you know, does result ultimately in an attenuated real economy and fewer and fewer people getting appropriately paid jobs. I mean, the jobs become fewer and they become of lesser quality. And eventually you have a major political and social crisis. So I think we will be I hope it's not a traumatic experience. That's <laughs> Can I just, just say one very last thing, because I'm glad you brought up Boris Johnson, because, of course, um, there is the issue, which is, of course, a, you know, not perhaps important in terms of the world. But, you know, I live in Britain. I'm British. Alistair, you're British, too. I think one country that is going to have to make some very serious and important decisions about its role is going to be Britain specifically. In fact, I think we're coming very close in Britain to a second different type of em end of empire moment. And I have to say, I feel that one of the reasons for the extraordinary vehemence of British policy about Ukraine, its overcommitment to support of Ukraine, is that ultimately it's a, it's a device for keeping the Americans still in Europe, still pushing this policy of, you know, using the Americans, keep them here, keep them in Europe. That makes us important. That makes, uh, because, you know, we're able that way to move along on America's coattails. Now, somehow or other, in one way or another, despite all the enormous problems of understanding and thinking, that you uh, spoke about in the United States, about which I completely agree, the Americans are not so long now. They're going to they're going to go. They're not going to go completely, but they're not going to be this enormous power that they were either in the world or even in Europe itself. And this policy, which we've followed actually quite successfully in Britain ever since the Second World War of remaining meaningful by being, you know, a long, you know, part of the American train. I think that's, that's coming to its end. And we need to start thinking beyond that. We still need to start thinking beyond that in terms of how we structure our own economy and our own society but also about how we conduct our foreign relations and not just about Europe, which is, of course, important, but also globally as well. And I think that is going to be a very traumatic and very difficult experience and one which our political class in Britain is completely unprepared for. Anyway, that's just my own little uh, uh, you know, rant about this, if you like. I don't know what you think about that, Alistair. No, I think I understand, I agree what you're suggesting. That is, you know, that in betting and investing so heavily in the Ukraine project for the reasons you said, um, we've mortgaged our future, our economic future, Europe's economic future. And that I think this is going to become much more apparent as the recession comes into, into being and these inflation continues to rise. I mean, you know, it's obvious here in, in Italy, and I know that in Britain, I mean, the social stresses and the political stresses from this, I mean, they mortgage things ex without, um, with their decisions they took on uh, sanctioning Russia, um, thinking that they could live without Russian gas and that it would be fine to buy LNG at seven times uh, the cost of the pipeline gaps and it wouldn't affect their economy. And I don't think they really thought any of this through. And now look at us. We have, you know, 
uh, we are in the industrial life, and I mean that's the the, the one thing that sort of kept uh, the 60% of the population is the raw income, the ones that couldn't have these, you know, inflated, exaggerated incomes that a big merchant bank or investment bank, I mean, wanted, needed work, and this isn't available. That's what they bet in order to try and keep on side with the United States. That bet is failed. What will be the political consequences? I can't foresee, but I there will be political consequences uh, for sure. I mean, Europe has really put itself into, um, I mean, it's just mortgaged our future. We always seem to finish off here on a pessimistic <laughs> note, but uh, uh, any final comments, Alexander, before we... Well, well it, it can also be... I, mean, I, I accept there's going to be a period of extreme turmoil and a very difficult period of turmoil, but I mean, I think we also need to understand, and our leaders perhaps need to understand, that the system that we are trying to sustain is ultimately unsustainable. And once it's gone... If it's handled properly, if the you know we come out of it in an intelligent way, it could actually be a liberating moment. We can start doing things which we are preventing ourselves from doing in a way that could actually enhance our prosperity and our security. It, what it needs is imagination, but there is very little and planning, and there's very little of either at the moment. Uh, you know, I know that I, when I make these points, um, it sounds very pessimistic, it sounds really quite bleak and very positive, because I have, I mean, this is a sort of subjective thing, of course, but I have the sense that the, the globe, the whole planet is moving through an inflection point. One of these great changes that happens once every 500 millennia, again, where sort of consciousness and people's thinking suddenly begins to change. We don't know the exact reasons for this, but somehow suddenly civilization and things start a new chapter. I believe we're in that process. But first, I just boost uh, in a way that we have to go through a catharsis to get to the point where the, the green shoots of what's coming next really can become visible and that we can start to see which of the green shoots are the ones that are going to you know, we need to attend to, we need to be take care of, we need to cultivate. At the moment, those green shoots will simply be erased by the forces that don't want to see any green shoots emerge. But it's going to come. It's going to come, for sure. And on that note, uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Alistair Crook, for coming on. It's been yeah, a great pleasure. Um, yeah, and thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, also, thanks to you, Alexander. And um, yeah. Well, can I just also add my own thanks to Alistair? It's been wonderful to have this discussion. Such an, such an erudite discussion, if I can say, in covering so many, uh, so many important topics. Mm -hmm.